chance to ask the astronauts about that. I think John was trying to establish contact hmm. with them there. We got him. Uh, on, let's, let's, let's go ahead. Let's get uh, talking to them. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Jim Hulsehouse, John Holloman at CNN, along with Riz Khan at CNN International. We've got a, a huge audience for you guys today all over the world in uh, about 210 countries or looking in. They have uh, emailed us some questions. Some people have called in on the phone with questions. The first question, though, I'd like to ask you is from uh, Donna Shirley, who's the manager of NASA's Mars Pathfinder project. She's joining us here. She wants to know if all of you would like to go to Mars if you got the opportunity. How about it? I'll pass the mic around, but speaking for myself, I'll sign up for the program any day they, uh, they uh, pass that sign-up sheet around. <laughs> Can't be that bad up there if they want to go that far. <laughs> yes, I'll go too. As a young boy, I always wanted to uh, have a chance to go to the moon and to have a potential opportunity to go to Mars would be even a, a quantum leap above that, so I'd go in a second. Send me. <laughs> How about it, Roger? Last man in line up there. What else can I say, eh? <laughs> Well, if the shuttle could make it, you probably uh, would get there uh, without a lot of trouble. One thing you can't do, and one thing that a lot of our viewers are calling in and wanting to know about, you can't get to the Russian space station Mir. Uh, a couple of days ago, you were about 60 miles away. You were able to look at them. Uh, tomorrow, about uh, probably uh, 20 hours uh, from now, you'll get 75 miles away from Mir. Uh, Riz, we had a question from a viewer in Germany about That's this. That's right. Yes, if you could put that to them, please. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not far from the damaged space station. It must be very bad feeling that you all are not able to help them. Is there, is there any way, um, and let me uh, give this to Jim Hulsell, is there any way you could help them if the problems on Mir got worse? Actually, uh, from our given orbit, we cannot get to the Mir. It's at a higher inclination orbit that we simply don't have the, uh, the fuel to reach at this point. Uh, uh, we did have the opportunity, as you mentioned, to see Mir a few days ago, and actually I did not, but Susan did, so let me, uh, let me pass it off to her and let you, let you hear it from her. Yeah, actually, Don and I saw Mir the other night, and it was spectacular. Mir was the brightest thing in the sky, and she just passed almost directly over ahead of us and almost close enough to reach out and touch them. And yes, of course, we wish we could go help them. Unfortunately, Columbia can't get to that inclination. All right, here's a viewer question from Robert in England who uh, called in moments ago. And he wants to know what the most spectacular thing you have seen so far on this mission is. Might be something in your space lab, might be something out the window. Um, you can, um, how about it, Roger Crouch? Uh, could you take this, the most spectacular thing you have seen so far on this mission? We've got a bunch of people offering up opportunities. I'll go first. The, uh, I think the most spectacular thing I've seen on this mission compared to my previous flights are dust storms. There's a tremendous amount of dust blowing off the African continent right now, and it's headed uh, toward the west, toward North and South America. And to be able to see those plumes of dust reach out those thousands of miles and know that it's actually what's happening in Africa is right now impacting the weather in Atlanta and all across the United States, it, it's an interesting and a privileged vantage point for us to have to be able to see that happening. No kidding, Jim. And we have a lot of viewers in Africa who are uh, probably watching this and looking out the window and saying <laughs> they can see our dust storm, too. <laughs> Pretty fascinating. John, we get a lot of uh, questions from literally everywhere around the world. Um, and we had, uh, we had one that came from Holland, as you can see there. All right. Okay. This is a good question. I, I, let me ask Susan Still this question, if I may. How do you prepare yourself psychologically and physically for a trip into space? Well, John, um, the psychological part comes naturally for me. I mean, I was flying fighter jets in the Navy before this, and I've been on and off of aircraft carriers, and, and so it's uh, kind of natural for me to take this step into space. Uh, as far as physically, all the astronauts try and stay physically fit before they go into the mission because they're not going to get any more physically fit once they're up here. And uh, we do ride the bicycle every day up here to keep our cardiovascular system working fine so that once we get on the ground, it won't be quite so hard to readapt to 1G. Yeah, all right. Um, Riz, I think we got another question. Another one yet from, from the United Kingdom. Oh, this is from uh, Neville Kidger. All right, uh, folks, um, this is from a viewer who... Uh, Tell me who's doing the most work on the, uh, um, on the fire experiments, the fire in space. This is a question specific to that. You can just pass the microphone over to the fire in space expert. 
Um, and the question is, why are your experiments on fire in the combustion module so important during this mission? And what applications can these experiments have for those of us who probably will never get to fly in space, but who uh, have a lot of experience with fire down here on Earth? part of our economy, Billion, hundreds of billions of dollars a year are spent on energy, 90% of which comes from combustion. Uh, it's also a very important part of our foreign trade deficit. Uh, so if we can move the body of knowledge of combustion science forward, that can have broad ramifications in all areas of applied combustion science. Automobiles, jet aircraft, power plants, all kinds of things that use combustion. And so the experiments we're trying to do up here, and they're being very, they're very successful as well, is to uh, try and move the fundamental knowledge of combustion forward. All right, Doug. Um, let's see. Uh, Janice, you want to add anything to that as payload commander and an expert on all these experiments? I'd like to ask you, uh, Janice Voss, what, um, what the most interesting of all these experiments in the space lab, uh, which one is at the top of your list? Well, that's not a very fair question to ask because, of course, they're all special, and that's really true. On, on the first day we did the laminar soot from one of the combustion experiments, and it was so cool. We had Roger, um, yeah, Roger and no, Greg and Jim and me, all three of us hanging at all different angles watching this experiment go by, and that was great. On flight, on our second, my second flight day, flight day three, we had the drop of combustion experiment, and the first two drops got flung off as they were trying some different techniques, and the third one was a beautiful burn, and that was exciting on that day, and I can't wait to see what great experiments we're going to run today. John, I'm going, to, yes, I'm going to bring back in Donna Shirley, who's the uh, Pathfinder project manager. She's joining us from Pasadena, California. And uh, Donna, I know you can't speak directly to the astronauts, but John can relay your question to them. Do you have another brief question for them up in space there? Uh, just that uh, I wanted to tell them that uh, we're working on getting them the information so that they can okay. go to Mars. Well, they're working on information uh, at NASA there so they can go to Mars. That you might want to pass that on. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Uh, they said in answer to your question about everybody wanting to go to Mars, astronaut uh, colleagues, um, they're working on it at JPL. They're trying to pave the way for you. So that's probably pretty good news on this American Independence Day. Another quick question. Um, this is for Jim Hulsell, I think. Jim, um, in a pre-flight briefing, you said that uh, the fact that your first mission was cut so short and the fact that you got to spend a couple of months back here on Earth got, uh, allowed the scientists who prepared all these experiments to make some modifications and improvements and make them even better this time. Oliver Kloss in Germany wants to know what sorts of improvements have been made to the experiments. Well, I better pass that off to uh, one of our payload experts here. Let me pass it off to Don. We basically modified some of the parameters uh, based on what we learned the, the first go around uh, on Tempest, one of our uh, electromagnetic levitation furnaces that comes from uh, Germany and the German Space Agency. We've modified the parameters that we use to levitate our samples. Uh, we're using the same materials, the same metals uh, to process. We've changed the parameters slightly based on what we learned uh, on STS-83. Okay, this question for Roger Crouch, I think. Uh, a viewer, uh, Christopher in Brazil, wants to know, Roger, if it is difficult for a regular person to become an astronaut. I, I, I know a lot about your background, and uh, you're a, you know, a, a brilliant scientist and all that, but in real life you're a regular person, and there you are sitting on the space shuttle. Uh, how tough was it for you to get to the point where you could take uh, your second trip of a lifetime in four months? Well, it, it's pretty easy to get up here once, they, once you get selected. It's the getting selected part that takes a lot of luck and a lot of hard work and a lot of patience, I think. Uh, as far as being on orbit, the first day or two takes a little bit of adjustment, and then after that it's just the most wonderful feeling you can imagine, even for an average Joe like me. <laughs> Roger, before, uh, before you pass the microphone, I've got to ask you about the space sickness thing. Everybody talks about it. They, uh, uh, what actually, what does it feel like to get space sick? I mean, are you throwing up or you just have headaches? Or, or what, what happened to you uh, on your first flight and what, was it any different on your second flight? Well, a lot of different people have a lot of different symptoms. And normally it's not the actual nausea that gets you. It's, it's sort of a feeling that uh, the first time I was up here, I felt like a balloon that was being pulled down underwater, and sort of like the top part of me was had more pressure on it than the rest of my body, and that was kind of a strange feeling. You have a sort of a feeling of fullness, like if you lay down after you eat for the first day or two, 
the adaptation between the first mission and this mission has been really incredible for me because this one was so much easier than the first time. Well, I'm glad everybody's surviving. Anybody else have any uh, any bad trouble um, with adaptation syndrome, as uh, as the NASA speak is, or did most of you guys just kind of zoom through this? Yeah, I think the, the the real data point on this whole flight is if you let a crew fly three months apart, the second time around, the adaptation is is very quick, uh, almost painless, I would call it. And I think that'll be a medical uh, point of interest for all the doctors back home because they've never really had uh, this number of people refly this quickly before, and I, and I know they're going to be interested in that. Uh, my interest now will be on landing to see if uh, what held true on coming into orbit also holds true on landing. That is, our readaptation to 1G is just as quick. Yeah. So, Jim, if, if NASA said, we'll let you guys go back up in October, same crew, and refly these experiments, uh, you and your crew would have no problem with that, right? I see a lot of shaking heads. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> we've had, had a lot of questions. Facts to us, Riz. Yes. Uh, well, actually, John, I was wondering about the workload up on this trip for them. That's right. Is, your guys are working 24 hours a day. Uh, how hard is the work? We're just pleased you got a few minutes to share with us. But, I mean, when you're not sitting around, you know, floating around doing TV interviews, how busy is your, is your workload? Yeah, Janice, you're the uh, you're the commander. Very hard on the ground. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. We work very hard on the ground to try to maximize the amount of science without overworking the crew, so you don't get tired people that will make mistakes. They very carefully plan the mission, both for power levels and crew time, to try to keep a pretty constant level of work. And they've been doing a superb job. I would say they hit it just almost exactly right. We're working pretty continuously on the entire spectrum of experiments, and the handovers come at good times where we can break and and not have any cooperate experiments going on, and yet we're getting all the science done. So I would say the workload is just about perfect. All right, we've got uh, less than a minute of satellite time left. It is Independence Day in the United States, and this interview is being broadcast live to every country but the United States, but it'll be broadcast to the United States on tape a little later. Any words for the people of the world or uh, your home country as you uh, float around uh, 160 miles above us? <laughs> Well, certainly, we, uh, uh, we're celebrating a very special day up here, as everybody in the United States is, and it is the 4th of July, and we, and we feel very privileged to have the opportunity to celebrate that very important holiday up here in space. Uh, and we'd like to point out that there are a lot of Americans all over the world, I'm sure many watching this broadcast right now, serving their country in a number of different ways, uh, from the military service to the foreign service to businesses spread far and wide across this world. And uh, I think I'd like to, in real time, repeat something that we tried yesterday. Okay, I see some nods here. On behalf of all Americans everywhere. Happy birthday, America! <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh, crew of Columbia, thank you very much. We were just so excited to see all of you, uh, in, in, instead of just a couple uh, that we'd been told we'd get. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day. We're thinking about you here, and uh, I'm trying to keep the folks on the ground uh, as up-to-date as I can amidst the other space stories uh, about how successful your experiments and your mission has been so far. We'll see you when you get back about the 17th, I guess. Uh, uh, happy flight, safe, safe time up there. John, and thanks to you very much for putting our viewer questions from around the and world. And our viewers. Jeez, yeah. Our viewers have much better questions than I do. Uh, thank <laughs> we'll all of you for, uh, for checking in with these excellent questions. <laughs> John, thanks to you as well for joining us here on Q&A. A first for us, getting questions from around the world to out of this world. That was great.